Our first presenter is a top disability attorney in Atlanta, Georgia. She's also a board member of a Hypersomnia Foundation. She has uh, represented numerous clients with IH and related disorders, and she's presented for the Hypersomnia Foundation on the past, in the past on um, going through the disability process and how to manage the appeals process. But today she's going to take a slightly different approach. She's going to be sharing her experience of staying up close, the emotional challenges that our clients often confront when they decide to apply for disability or they start to think about applying for disability. Um, and she'll be offering some suggestions on how to cope with those. So I'm delighted to turn the program over to Angel Burgess. Thank you, Diane. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Over the past 10 years, I have been representing families in social security disability claims. One of the biggest challenges that we have to work through in going through this process is the emotional aspect of disability and being disabled. The emotional aspects have often had significant effects on my client's ability to seek and receive much needed help. I think that in taking a closer look into what drives the resistance to the words disabled or disability will help so many people to get the support that they need. My hope today is that this presentation will help all of you to embrace new ways of thinking about disability and support. So with that being said, I'd like to start off talking about the word disability. What does it mean? Well, that depends on who you ask and the purpose for which the word is to serve. If we look to Marion Webster Dictionary, um, a disability is defined as a physical, mental, cognitive, or developmental condition that impairs, interferes with, or limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks or actions or participate in typical daily activities and interactions. If we look to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, their definition is a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. And if we look to the Social Security Administration, their definition is much more specific. Um, and it states that a person who is unable to engage in any substantial gainful activity because of a medically determinable physical or mental impairment that is either expected to result in death or has lasted or is expected to last for at least one year. Now, the problem that I think that many people have with the word disability or themselves being disabled is that there is such a stigma associated with the words. A stigma is a mark of disgrace, which is associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. In my opinion, a st the stigma of disability exists primarily due to a combination of three flat factors or influences, uh, societal, emotional, and institutional influences or factors. I think that each of these factors has approximately an equal impact um, on the stigma and perpetuating the stigma of disability. When we look or think about societal factors, I think of the things that I see on TV or the things that I read about in the newspaper. Um, such as uh, stories about people who have applied for disability. Um, in particular, I remember one story that I saw about a man who was receiving disability benefits for his back. And there was some footage of this individual um, on vacation. And it appeared as though he was hiking and he was pushing a very large rock. Um, and, and so kind of the basis of that story was, look at all the fraud that exists within the disability system. You know, this man is representative of so many other people that are gaming or cheating the system. 
We also hear rumblings of um, opinions such as, you know, there's so many people that are receiving disability that they're going to cause the entire system to go bankrupt. And it's because of all that fraud that none of us will get retirement benefits in 15 to 20 years. Those are the types of um, beliefs or thoughts that perpetuate the stigma of disability. There are also institutional, um, what I call them, or organizational or entities um, that even though they may provide people with benefits, in doing so, it's so difficult to get those benefits that there is a bit of mistrust going on, or there seems to be a lot of mistrust going on. That if I apply for disability, whether that's through the Social Security Administration, the Veterans Administration, um, long-term disability, a teacher's uh, disability program, any sort of disability program, there seems to be a general perception that the baseline is fraud and that we need to send private investigators uh, to follow people to see if they're really disabled. And we need to you know, scrutinize the things that people are doing because they're trying to, to defraud the system. And I think that those two, the societal and the institutional or organizational um, influences have a lot to do with how we personally perceive the words disability and disabled. So there's a big emotional factor that prevents people, in my opinion, from being able to get the support that they need. Now, over the years, I have talked to many clients. I've talked with um, people in the IH community about how they view disability and what it means to them to be disabled or hear the words disability. And I've heard a lot of um, really powerful things like, you know, feeling like you need to hide the symptoms from other people because you don't want anyone to know the things that you're going through. Feeling like disability is a label and you don't want that label to be placed upon you um, because you've worked very hard at accomplishing your goals and your symptoms have caused some interruption in the pursuit of those goals. I've had people to tell me that they felt that disability meant that they had to be dependent on someone else and that they did not want to depend on any other person or the government or a private insurance company um, to be able to sustain that. I've seen and, and heard people express um, feelings of grief associated with the loss of a former life, um, some depression associated with the fact that I am now at a place where I'm not able to do the things that I used to do. And I've also seen people express some denial. They said, yes, I've got this diagnosis um, of IH and it's affecting me greatly, but I am not disabled. You know, I'm, I'm not able to do the things that I need to do to get through a typical day on schedule, but I am not disabled because being disabled is bad. I've also um, had people come to the point of acceptance and realizing that yes, this is where I am, but I control the narrative from here on out and I can decide what disability means to me. Now the problem with all of these influences um, in our lives, and, and that can also include friends and family members and their perspectives on disability, is that the stigma does more harm than good in many aspects. The stigma prevents us from seeking treatment. We don't want to go to the doctor because we don't want to you know, get a diagnosis for which there is no cure. We don't want to be disabled, so we won't get the treatment that we need. It prevents us from asking for help. 
And that's help from a spouse, from a family member, from a friend, because we feel that we need to hide the things that we are experiencing, um, particularly when the disability is an invisible one that no one can tell just from looking at you what's going on. So oftentimes it's easier to hide what's going on and not ask for any help instead of acknowledging that you're having significant difficulties. The stigma also prevents us from collecting and retaining documents which prove that we are having problems or difficulties. I have so many clients and have had over the years that in the workplace or at school, their symptoms have been so disruptive that it has affected their performance. Um, and it has obviously affected their performance in that things start happening, like their grades start falling or they may start failing classes. Um, in the workplace, a supervisor may um, write you up. And those things are so devastating um, to us who are trying to work hard to accomplish our goals that sometimes our response is, I'm gonna take that letter and I'm throwing it in the trash. I am ripping it up. I'm destroying any evidence of things that suggest that I can't do what I used to do. And while I certainly understand, you know, the impact that the negative information has on you, in the long run, it could be those documents that are so helpful in getting the support that you need. The stigma also prevents us from requesting accommodations at school or in the workplace. And in doing so, it encourages us to throw in the towel, right? You're having trouble at work, you've been written up, you feel like you're going to be fired, so you just quit. You just say, I can't do this job anymore, and you quit. Or you're having trouble at school, your grades are falling, you are perhaps on academic probation, and you just withdraw. And oftentimes we do these things without first exploring other options or the use of accommodations. And accommodations may be such that they are helpful enough to us that it allows us to be able to accomplish our goals. The stigma also prevents people from filing for benefits that they need, um, such as short-term disability, long-term disability, and social security disability. So instead of applying for, that, for those benefits, if you just throw in the towel, not only are you causing a significant financial disruption to you and your family, but you may also lose your health insurance, which in turn prevents you from being able to go to the doctor and perhaps get the medications that you need to continue to support you. So what do we do with this? I think it's important to debunk the stigma. Look at things which prove to us that the society's um, opinions about disability and being disabled are largely unfounded. First, having a disability does not necessarily mean that you're not able to work. There are many people that have disabilities that are able to successfully work. So one does not equate to the other. The Social Security Administration has actually taken quite an interest um, in the areas of fraud um, and in looking to see what happens to people after they have um, received an unfavorable decision in a hearing. So the Social Security Administration has uh, taken a big look at fraud. And over the years, they have really um, focused on investigating fraud to see at what um, prevalence rate it exists 
as it relates to disability claims. And according to the Social Security Administration, the fraud incidence rate for disability claims is less than 1%. So, you know, that statistic alone lets me know that things that we see, like the story about the man pushing the big rock um, as he's hiking, that's an outlier. He is an outlier. He is not the norm. He is not the typical person that receives disability. And there is no actual evidence that fraud is anywhere near a problem in disability claims. Rather, the evidence shows that fraud is nearly non-existent. Furthermore, the Social Security Administration has conducted studies to see what happens to people who have been denied disability benefits. So typically, when you're going through the disability process, you're going to get a denial after your initial application, you'll appeal it and get another denial, and then you'll go in front of a judge and have a hearing. So in this particular study, Social Security was interested in a group of people who had been denied by a judge, and they wanted to see what happened to that same group of people four years later. And what this study showed us was that of the people that had been denied four years previously, almost 25% of them remained out of work four years later. So they never went back to work four years later, almost 25%. So you ask, okay, I mean, that's pretty significant, but what about the other 75%? Well, that's even more telling because of the remaining 75%, approximately 12.5% of the applicants had returned to work full-time. So they were able to get back into the workforce full-time, 12.5% of people four years later. Another 12.5% had returned to work, but not in a capacity in which Social Security would consider to be substantial. So essentially they had returned to work in a part-time capacity. That's 12.5%. Approximately 8% of those individuals were no longer eligible for benefits. And they were ineligible for reasons including death. Um, some had credits that had expired, so they weren't eligible for any benefits. Um, others had too much money in resources and weren't eligible for benefits and others had reached full retirement age, so they weren't eligible for disability benefits. Now the remaining approximately 29% of those same applicants were receiving disability benefits four years later. And so what that means is that they had applied, possibly reapplied after that judge's denial and had been approved, or they had gone through the appeals process, um, perhaps even up to the federal appellate level, and they had ultimately been approved, again, off the basis of that earlier denial. And then lastly, 13% had a pending claim. And so that means that they had either reapplied um, and were waiting for a decision, or they had appealed that last judge's denial and were waiting to see what happened in the appeals process. So really, four years later, more than half of the people um, who had been previously denied by a judge still were not able to work. That provides some support for my personal belief which is that most people that apply for disability benefits apply because they need it. Not because they wanna take advantage of the system, but because they need it. And contrary to popular belief, you cannot get rich 
off of disability benefits. You know, the average person receives close to $1,300 per month in disability benefits. That's the average person. But it depends on whether you're receiving pro, uh, benefits based off your work history or you're receiving SSI. And for SSI, the, most people will receive up to about $794 per month. It's just no way to get rich off of receiving Social Security disability benefits. Now, the other thing that's important to know in debunking the stigma um, is that when you apply for disability, your application is private. So, so many people say to me, I don't want anybody else to know. I don't want my friends to know. I don't want my family members to know that I've applied for disability and I feel like I can't do this because I'm gonna be exposed. People are gonna know. And the fact of the matter is that's not correct. Your application is private. All matters pertaining to your claim are accessible to Social Security. And if you have an attorney, they're accessible to your attorney as well. I also think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the words disability and disabled do not define you. Rather, you decide what those words mean to you and you can take the necessary steps to get what you need, um, regardless as to what anybody else may think about disability and being disabled. Now, in turning our view to new ways of thinking about disability and support, I think it's important to talk about the things that we protect. So, most of us who have cars, and hopefully all of us who have cars, have insurance, right? And that insurance is to protect our cars um, in the event that something happens to them, right? We want them to be repaired and or replaced if necessary. We protect our home um, in the event that something happens to it so that we can get the necessary repairs or rebuild or replace as necessary. We even protect our furniture, right? I don't want my dining room table to get scratches all over it and I have to live with the scratches. So I'm gonna pay for that protection plan so that it can be repaired as necessary. And we certainly protect our cell phones. We don't want those screens to be cracked. Um, we don't want anything to be damaged that would require us to buy a new phone. And it's almost like we protect these things in a manner that's effortless, right? We don't think too hard about whether we need to protect them. We just know that we do. But when it comes to ourselves and protecting ourselves, that's when we tend to say, you know what, it's not necessary or it's too expensive to have that additional you know, $50 a month taken out of my paycheck to pay for long-term disability. We tend to put ourselves on the back burner while we protect everything else. And in our new way of thinking about disability, our focus is on us. Becoming your best advocate. And that means pursuing treatment options, going from doctor to doctor until you find what works best for you until you find a diagnosis that both you and the doctor agree applies to you and your symptoms. That means learning about disability programs and protecting your greatest asset, which is you. Making sure that if anything would happen that interrupts your work, your ability to work, or if you're in school, that you have a backup plan there to protect you. It means keeping records, even if the things contained in those records are unpleasant or hurtful to you, you have to keep up with records that show that you've been absent, that you're missing too much work or school, that your grades have declined or that you may be failing, um, evaluations that show that there have been performance issues or write-ups. You need to keep copies of those things. Just put them in a folder, 
and stick them in a drawer. And one day, if you ever need them, you will be so glad that you advocated for yourself and not to keep that information. Ask for what you need to become your best self. And what I mean by that is if you are in school or if you are working, ask for what you need to allow you to continue to perform. If you need extra time taking tests, ask for it. If you need additional support, if you need um, extended deadlines, ask for those things. If you are at work and you need more frequent breaks, ask for it. If you need um, you know, deadlines that are not as, as tight, ask for those things because the only way that you are going to be able to utilize the accommodations that you are entitled to is if you ask for them. Apply for the benefits that you need, no matter what anybody else thinks, family members, friends, the community, don't worry about anybody else's opinion. Ask for what you need. Apply for the benefits that you need. Do what's best for you. And in doing so, even though it's hard to say, yes, I'm disabled, or yes, I need these benefits, reset your expectations and say, I'm going to take you know, the things that I am able to do, and I'm gonna change the way that I do them so that it suits me. I'm going to find my purpose and do what's meaningful to me. Most importantly, know that you are not alone. Seek advice from other people that have similar experiences. I can assure you that you are not the first person that has experienced the things that you have or been in your shoes. So talk to other people. You will find that it is so helpful and you will get so many helpful suggestions that will allow you to get what you need. Join or form a support group. And there's a fantastic presentation coming up um, about this topic. So I'm not going to say anything other than utilize a support group, which is an incredibly valuable resource. And most importantly, help someone else. And helping someone else that is on this journey it is going to help you even more. I would like to share a quote um, with you all from a phenomenal young woman by the name of Lauren Crane. And Ms. Crane has um, done a great job in sharing her thoughts and her journey um, as she has been diagnosed uh, with a sleep disorder and is, is dealing with and making adjustments in her life um, with this knowledge. Ms. Crane says, but at some point I got tired of crying and I embraced this part of me. I joined the disability community on Twitter and started talking to more people with my sleep disorder. Sharing my experiences led me to find communities that I felt I belonged to. Um, yes, thank you, Angela. That's a tremendous presentation. And I think this is something that hasn't been talked about very much from, from how you're, you've described it. It sounds like the, the, the process itself with the denials and refiling the denials again is already emotional. And so having to deal with that, you know, your own self and how you feel about it is really important. And I've been jotting down some questions here. We have a viewer who'd like to know, how can family members and friends help support someone who is going through the process of applying for disability? I think family members are, and can be the most valuable resource um, in providing that encouragement. And, you know, most of the clients that I have that have struggled with applying for disability and being disabled have come because they've been encouraged or gently nudged by a family member that this is what you need. You know, this is, you need to have some financial support. You can have independence still. You need to be able to continue to have your health insurance and get your medications. Um, so we support you and we think that this is going to help you. Right, right. 
Um, I was really struck too, and uh, some of our viewers are as well, about the statistics of how low the fraud rate is. Um, and I do think that's how a lot of us have been you know, given that impression because of course, uh, for a news story, they're going to look for that outlier. That's right. um, how can all of us generally uh, help get past the, the stigma in society about disabilities? I think that a, a really good way to help get past the stigma um, is not to hide the things that you're experiencing. As you are helping other people with similar experiences, then you know, their families are then brought into it. Their families are given a better understanding of, okay, I, don't, I didn't really understand what it means to be disabled, but now I know. You know, I thought disabled meant that you couldn't get out of the bed or that, you know, you couldn't walk. And there's so many misconceptions about what it actually means to be disabled that as we bring more people kind of into the circle, that circle expands greatly. And then there's a, a much better understanding um, amongst society that disability, number one, is not a bad thing, but disability is right. not what we thought that it was that you can be disabled in many different ways. Right, and I don't know if it's the term still being used, but I know for a while it was that people were using the term differently abled to sort of get away from the negative of that disabled, mm -hmm. differently abled and what they can do. Um, we also have a viewer who's asking if, if you have ideas for how people can find uh, maybe a career coach or do you think that's a good idea to try to find something that they can do? I know it's not really your area, but have you seen clients that. Yes, actually, um, each state has um, vocational rehabilitation services, um, which are available. And uh, vocational rehabilitation is available through your state's Department of Labor. And the focus with vocational rehabilitation is to help people to find jobs that suit whatever needs that they may have. So typically they're working with people with disabilities to help them find jobs that will accommodate their disabilities. There are also private um, job coaches. There are also private groups that focus on helping people to build the necessary skills or just to find a job that complements their needs. Right. So I would start with the state's Department of Labor, um, wherever you live, to see what they can do to assist you. Great. Um, we're running short on time, so I'm going to see if I can put the last question sort of into a nutshell. First of all, there's a lot of people who would like to know how to contact you. Uh, there are a lot of people asking, uh, or some people asking some very specific questions about disability, and I just want to mention that everyone who's viewing today will get an email from us today that will have a link to a number of things, and one of them will be previous presentations that um, Angel has given on the nuts and bolts of applying for disability and going through the process. And um, Angel, it sounds like we need to bring you back because that's something that people always have questions about and want to know more about. Sure. Um, and let's see, I'm just taking a look. And there was just a, a, a quick question about whether you think the pandemic has affected the filing for disabilities. Not exactly talking about the emotional aspect, but, but if you could sure. just address that briefly and then Absolutely. wrap up for us. Um, yes, the pandemic has affected the uh, application process for disability in a couple of ways. Um, hearing offices are closed to the public um, to protect the public and the judges and, and staff. So what Social Security has done to try to keep things moving is they've been uh, holding hearings by telephone. They have also recently introduced a video hearing option so that you can have a something, something similar to a Zoom type of hearing. Um, so those are the two options right now are the telephone and video hearings, but they are continuing to, to process claims. Um, everybody's working from home, so things aren't moving as quickly as they normally do, but just please be patient with it and know that they are going to get to you. Great, thank you. And now we'll, we'll, let, you, we'll let you wrap up. Thank you so much, it's been wonderful. Thank you.
Thank you, Diane. Um, in closing, I would like to share a quote with you all from uh, Rebecca Tossig in her book, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary, Resilient, Disabled Body. And Ms. Tossig says, the goal is not to avoid falling or needing help. The goal is to be seen, asked, heard, believed, valued as we are, allowed to exist in these exact bodies, invited to the party, and encouraged to dance however we want to.